All righty. Well, we want to keep this uh, to an hour. We know we're asking a lot of, of you all in the midst of a, of a very crazy season. So I'm going to do uh, some quick introductions and just some scene setting. So I'm Caroline with, um, with Chalkbeat. Um, for those who don't know, Chalkbeat Chicago is a nonprofit news organization uh, dedicated to writing about education. And we created this event because we were hearing from parents, teachers, and students how difficult of a time this is in many ways. Um, and we really wanted to create a space where we could kind of come together and just talk about it, um, talk about why this is a difficult time. Sorry, some technical difficulties on my end, how it could be uh, less so. So um, outside of the panelists, we just ask that everyone stay on mute. Uh, that's so we can hear each other clearly um, and not get too distracted by barking dogs and cats jumping on computers and all that good stuff. Um, if you have a question or comment, please drop it in the Zoom chat. We will be monitoring those. And if we don't get to your question, because we do have a, a finite amount of time, you can shoot us an email at community at chalkbeat.org or just respond to any of the emails that we've sent you through Eventbrite that, that goes to that community at chalkbeat.org uh, email address and we'll do our, do our best to get those questions answered. I want to say a note of thanks to Britannica Digital Learning our event sponsor who provides uh, some free emergency resources right now to every school in the US. And that link is to, to what they are doing is a part of the emails I sent you all as well. So some quick introductions, um, just ask that you guys wave when I say your name. So first off, Cassie, our bureau chief at Chalkbeat Chicago. She's our moderator for today. And then we also have Carla, a fourth and fifth grade national board certified teacher who educates students at John W. Cook Elementary. She uses her scholars' interest to create curriculum that engages them in learning. Shyla is an English and drama teacher at Peking Community High School, where she serves on the district's technology committee creating technology instruction. She's also a Teach Plus Illinois Policy Fellow, advocating for teacher so uh, shortage policy solutions in Illinois. Brian is a biology instructor at Garcia High School in his seventh year of teaching. He prides himself on hands-on inquiry curriculum, but also being someone students learn to trust and relate to. Artemis is a diverse learning instructor working with middle school students at Budlong Elementary and is a longtime advocate for inclusive practices, including weaving social and emotional learning into curriculum. And finally, Emmanuel is a 2010 Golden Apple Scholar Golden Apple Crystal Apple recipient and National Board Certified Math Teacher at Kenwood Academy High School in Chicago. He loves teaching, mentoring, designing curriculum, coaching track and field, and working out when he has the time. Um, so welcome everybody again. Uh, for those who are joining, please use the chat. Please keep yourself on mute so we can all hear each other. And Cassie, let's get started. Great, thank you, Caroline. So today we're gonna to be talking about learning at home and how in the world can it be, can it go better? Um, I will just say I'm a parent of four children. So um, I'm speaking somewhat from experience, but also from talking to parents over the past few weeks that this is hard. And is, is, there, are, is there any collective wisdom that we can come together and make it um, any easier for people, any practical suggestions? Um, just to bring us to the place where we are, I know we all know that this is an unprecedented world event. Um, in Chicago, educators really only had about 72 hours to prepare for school closures. I think it was similar elsewhere in the state. And as the epidemic worsened here, the closures were extended. Um, the district has put together a more formal remote learning plan that goes into effect um, April 13th. And I know some parents are starting to hear from schools about what, what their plans will be. Um, at that point, by April 13th, students will have been out of school four weeks. And I think that if you're like me, every day is a new adventure and that's putting it optimistically. Um, so maybe we'll start with the first question. This is for any of our panelists to take. What are you hearing from your students and from your families so far? Are you hearing from them? And what sort of advice are you giving them? Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for being a part. Uh, this is Carla. 
So I am hearing from families and a lot of the families that I deal with in my community are emotionally dealing with it. And so my first step has been uh, seeing the human aspect of this and really addressing the emotional needs that my families are going through. Um, I just had one parent yesterday who was struggling getting her child online on the digital platforms that we had and she expressed that she was losing her mind and so at that point i paused i said this academic can wait um but let's 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 talk about how you're doing so really seeing the parents and the families for what their struggles are and what they're dealing with before i get to the academics has been a starting point for me I agree, Carla. Um, also, I've been hearing from parents of students and parents that I know personally that they feel the weight of having, you know, to support uh, their students at home with, you know, online lessons. I would just like to say that um, parents, you're not expected to take on the role of a teacher. I think um, I wanted to, you know, reassure everyone of that. I, I know I have three, three students. Um, at home, my own kids, and it, it is, you know, it could be a big struggle handling all of those assignments. What I would say is I would encourage parents to provide the structure for their kids and support them in the way um, that they're communicating with their teachers and just staying connected that way. But, you know, you're not expected to uh, have the, you know, provide all of this background or have the expertise in math or science that their regular teacher would have. I totally agree. Because, you know, at school, there's structure. There are class periods and teachers physically, verbally motivating kids, helping them um, develop self-regulation skills. And at school, we have worksheets and printers and massive copier machines that break sometimes. Um, but at home, you know, we don't, most families don't have access to those laptops and that internet and pen, uh, pencils and paper and the specific worksheets and uh, templates that we would usu usually give in a math classroom or the textbooks. Um, there are very limited resources. And what I'm hearing from my students and families is that they don't have access to internet at all times of the day, or they don't have a laptop or they have to share one device amongst six members of the family, or they have to babysit. So I totally second that. I don't think the parents should be, quote unquote, taking the role of the teacher. Um, Cause that's, that's a huge burden and that really would negatively influence the social emotional learning um, that inter intersects with academia. Um, just to thank you, Emmanuel, just to chime in really briefly on that note, I think it's okay to, as a family, to give yourself some grace and realize that the home is not a classroom and it's okay if your schedule might look a little bit different uh, than the schedule of a normal classroom. Uh, and then secondly, what I've heard from uh, my students quite a bit, and I teach uh, secondary students, so high school students, um, a lot of my students want to express uh, that they are bored <laughs> and that they miss school, which is endearing for me, me to hear, but also um, not necessarily in the situation. But what they really miss is community in the classroom. And what's happened now is a lot of our learning has become isolated to where we're doing a lot of the same content, but it's on your own. Um, and that community is one, good for learning, and two, uh, for your social emotional health to be talking to peers and adults and mentors. So as a parent, maybe some ways that you could be thinking about your day is uh, to allow yourself to structure in a way that works for your family. And um, two, to find ways uh, through teachers or maybe um, your own neighborhoods and community to keep your students connected um, to people their age outside of the home, too. That, that's great advice. My, I, my question, I, I think my next question would be for Carla and for Artemis, because you both have... 
children at home and your educators, how are you structuring your day? And what have you learned works? And what have you learned does not work? Because I feel like right now, the list of what doesn't work for me personally is much longer than the list of what does work. So for me, uh, as we began, I have a third grader and a second grader, and they still need much support from me. Uh, I can't just send them off to complete an assignment. Um, and I had to be honest with them. I'm very big on um, naming emotions and being honest with feelings that might be experienced with the situation. So throughout that first week, I sat my daughters down and I said, hey, listen, this is new to me, uh, new to you. I'm going to need your patience. And so I really had to set that structure from the beginning that even though you see mommy here, mommy still has a responsibility of, of teachers, of other students, of her job that need her attention just as much as you do. And so I had to let them know that I am multitasking. So there are going to be times where I need you to be independent and times where we can work together. So that structure alone and having that conversation, I think helped a whole lot. And I can honestly say homeschooling my own is very different than the classroom. And um, my daughters are very honest with me in regards to what they think about my teaching. And I'm like, wait a minute, I'm national board certified. What are you talking about? <laughs> so there is a little hit to the ego that occurred in the beginning. Um, but I am one thing that has worked is me being flexible. I have to be flexible throughout my day. I have learned that my daughters need breaks. They need time away from the content and from the learning. And so having breaks has, has really worked. And me just really taking in what is happening and how am I having those conversations with my daughters. I found a, listened to a really good podcast that I felt was very appropriate for them in regards to the coronavirus on the daily. And so I turned that into a lesson where I had them listen to it and we discussed it and talked about it. So that's another thing that has worked very well, just taking in opportunities and experiences, given the times that we are in and having those conversations with my daughters. I agree. I, uh, I, I, for my eight-year-old, I actually had to make a, 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 a structured schedule. And I think, I was talking to Brian about this yesterday, I think that was really helpful um, because he was able to kind of check out check off um, the assignments that he completed at, you know, throughout the hour. So it really helped him to stay focused and just to you know, know what's coming up next, right? And to balance his um, online time with his workbook time. I have an eighth grader who does not need as much structure, but what I did is I gave him like a calendar for him to fill in and he knows what time breakfast is gonna be. He knows what time lunch, is so that he can plan his um, day throughout. And then I have a junior who is um, who regulates himself well. So I've also been kind of pairing him up with the, with the second grader so that um, he can see what it looks like to stay focused and um, engaged in your work. So having, having someone also besides me model that um, quiet time. Uh, I don't know if Brian wanted to chime in, but we were talking about variety in the classroom too. Just like in the classroom, I think parents need to have that structured a little bit at home too, uh, like little breaks. I schedule little dance breaks or whatever, as like Carla was saying, something fun. Well, I think it's important to, to realize that, I mean, this is stressful in everybody, right? So you're, you're trying to push a child into education at home, which is uncomfortable and weird and not usual. So how do you make that relevant? How do you make that interesting? How do you involve them and make them want to to play along with this, right? And so Artemis and I talked about, like we said, having breaks, having things you can cross off, having incentives, uh, having a variety of activities. So it's not just all writing, maybe it's writing and then we do a skit with it, or we make it into a song, or we do a drawing of it, or we build something, something else that tries to keep that, keep it interesting so that's not just, okay, we're gonna read this now. Um, and that's all we're doing. Um, Cause it's tough, it's tough on, parents to develop a curriculum on the spot and it's tough for students to buy into that when they're at home and they'd rather just you know be gaming or napping 
I'm curious, and, and Brian, we can stay with you for a moment. Um, what is your expectation, and, and I'm eager to hear from everybody, about what's actually happening during this time? I've actually felt conflicted about that as a parent. Should I be actually, should my child be growing in the concepts that he knows um, or they know, or should we be just trying to hold steady at what they've been doing, so largely review, or should I just be trying to make sure his brain doesn't ferment? I don't know. Um, and I, some days I feel differently about what expectation I'm setting for him and for myself. So the, the information that I've gotten from my school is that I'm not supposed to be really pushing new content. So that obviously limits me when I do um, Google Hangouts with students or the discussions we have. I'm not gonna press forward because it's not equitable for students who don't have the laptop, don't have access. I can't press on to photosynthesis and leave kids behind. Um, so uh, for me, that's meant more enrichment. That's meant more talk, because I teach science, but talking about like scientific practices, uh, talking about developing hypotheses or claims, evidence and reasoning, things that they're gonna still need to do regardless, um, but not so much pushing into new material because I don't think that's fair to the folks that just don't have it. Anybody else who wants to jump in on that question? We addressed it a little bit at the top, but I'm just curious what anybody else would think or any other sort of advice you'd give to an anxious parent trying to figure out what that expectation level is. Yeah, I think during this time, it's really important for us to make sure that this digital divide doesn't prohibit uh, students with uh, fewer resources than other students from attaining high quality and enriching uh, education. Um, so having said that, I think, you know, during these times, we got to keep it as simple as possible. Structure is very important, but also simple. Uh, messaging has to be succinct throughout, you know, all of the course teams at your school, across the administrations, across to each household out there. So I think at a minimum, I, the the most simple thing we can do is to try and attempt to retain and maintain what we've already done um, so that, you know, we, we're not building this, this, this situation where a lot, a lot of students, a lot of selectively chosen students are continuing up the ladder of rigorous education while, you know, not everybody can do that because of access to achievement. Um, so we definitely have to keep in mind the identity and cultures and just, just everything that is enveloping this, this, this pandemic. Um, so keep it simple. And let's try to retain what we have already covered. So another question I have for each of you, so we're keeping it simple. I'm going to go off of that, Emmanuel. And I have, from one of my child's teachers, I have a list of 12 different links and things to look at, which as a parent with four kids, multiply that times four. That's a lot. Um, so I'd love to go around the horn and, and just start with, is there a single resource for each of you that if your kids or your, your students did looked at nothing else, you would say, go here? or something that you found that is really, uh, really special. Um, and, and maybe since Emmanuel, we ended with you, we could just start with you there. Yeah, so, you know, to keep it as simple as possible, um, I've been sharing resources and collecting resources with the Golden Apple Foundation, and they have this, this website with just a huge uh, compilation of resources, uh, but, there's also a section that has more specific targeted activities with advice from teachers to other teachers, but also advice from teachers to parents on how to implement. Um, so, you know, in, in those, those files, those resources on that website, um, there is something that I've created, for example, like a 130 page uh, packet with linked videos to every single skill we've done in the past, plus uh, the pre-recorded videos that I've already recorded with, for my kids in September, October, November. 
some practice problems, solution keys, I've differentiated it. So that's just like one thing amongst, you know, that, that list of resources that um, have been collected on that website. And so I think, you know, at least for my junior year Algebra 2 kids, if they took their time, you know, not pushing, not pushing timelines or anything, but if they took their time and just, you know, covered a skill, saw a video, and they range from two minutes to five minutes, some are 30 minutes, but not all of them, right? Um, these are things that we've done in the past and it's as simple and structured as possible. Um, and it ensures that everybody could get access to it because we've done it in the past, but also I'm not gonna pe penalize my students for not being able to access that document if they don't have access to a device, you know? So just providing access to learning and resources, I think is very critical for us right now. Brian, I'm gonna throw it to you because I think science has been something, that's something I think of as how does that happen if it's not in the classroom? What is something that you're seeing? Um, you guys are seeing all the anxiety I have as a parent here, but what is something that you're seeing or that you would really recommend for folks trying to deal with science at home? So it's been, uh, I mean, for all of us, right? But it's been a struggle, especially because I do a lot of labs and then we obviously can't do any labs. Uh, and so I toyed with the idea of doing the lab here on my dining room table and having them watch, but that didn't really seem fair either. Um, uh, we've talked about Khan Academy a lot at my school as a resource, just that kids can go on and stay fresh on topics. Um, I used to use Brain Pop uh, as another one, Century is another one. Uh, there's, a, there's a number of these that just kind of have just skill building kind of stuff that kids can do. Uh, for most teachers, I know they're supposed to be or potentially going to be stuff online created by teachers or relevant to each class though. So I've also told my kids that too. I've said, you guys all have Khan Academy accounts that are linked to your school emails and here's what I'm going to be talking about. So maybe a little bit of both, just me, just that, whatever you want at least until this gets kind of all hammered out. It's hard because I do a lot of labs and suddenly I can't do any labs. So it's definitely tough. Shayla, Carla, Artemis, what are your go-to or what is your recommend, standout recommendation for people? Yeah, thanks Cassie. A website that I think is really helpful right now is a website called wideopenschool.org. And um, I can put the link in the chat, uh, but what happened um, with this website is a lot of major education or education minded corporations like um, PBS, National Geographic, Scholastic, Google, Apple, all came together to put the resources in one place um, for families. And a really cool thing about this website is you can choose to view it as an educator or you can choose to view it as a parent. Um, and it splits up activities, uh, so you can have secondary, so um, like something that would be appropriate for a high schooler, middle schooler, or something appropriate for an elementary, a younger student. And um, they have everything from social, emotional um, learning activities uh, to live lessons. Uh, so for instance, if you logged on right now, um, I'm a drama teacher as well. You could watch a performance at the National Theater in the UK, or you could um, have a live drawing lesson from the illustrator of Captain Underpants. Uh, so it's great for community building. It also has individual subjects uh, that you can um, dive into uh, according to, you know, what your student's passionate about. And then lastly, it has a really cool daily schedule feature where it gives an activity for the morning, the afternoon, and the evening, and it involves student choice. So students can click through and um, make some choices for each part of the day. So that is a really stellar resource. Cassie, I understand your question um, centered around links. Uh, however, but thinking about my community and the students that I teach, uh, many of them do not have access to computers and internet. And so one thing that I have been suggesting to parents um, is that this is really a time to dive into what your child is interested in. Uh, there's a quote that I tell my parents at the beginning of the year um, by Miriam Wright, 
Elderman that I'm paraphrasing the quote, but basically says that parents rely so much on teachers as experts that they forget that they're the real experts. And so parents really use this time to dive into what is your child interested in? What does your child want to learn about? And so I've been working with my parents one, once they have figured out what interests their child, how can you then go about and infuse learning into what your child is interested in? And so if your child is interested in gaming, for example, like how can you use those games to teach your child about math, to teach your child about writing, to teach your child about coding, and really allowing that to drive the instruction within your class? Because one thing that I found as a teacher and also as a parent, once they are interested in something, that's my hook. I, I got them. And so finding that interest is going to be key right now. And it is something that I am encouraging my parents to really lean into what their child is interested in. That's a great point, Carla. That's a great point. Um, and Artemis, I, I wanted to make sure we included you in this question. Thank you. What I was going to say is um, second, uh, seconding um, Shayla's uh, resource of wideopenschools.org. Um, I looked into that as well. I was really very happy with their emotional well-being page in particular. I know on the chat, someone was asking about how to help get their kids back to learning after they take a break. Well, there you go. There's so many resources there that um, help you to practice mindfulness with your students. Um, someone also mentioned Go Noodle. I, I feel like that is on there as well. But just it, it's so important. They have um, ways that parents can talk to their, their kids about COVID um, right now. And I, I, I just love that because I, again, I feel like the most important thing is to make sure that the, you know, the students are okay emotionally, you know, make sure that your, your kids are okay now in, you know, a sense of calm, having a sense of calm, you know, just it's the number one priority. That's a perfect transition, actually, Artemis, to, to my next question. We've been talking about curriculum and, and, and different material approaches, but can we talk a little bit about classroom management? What, what are your recommendations or, or what is in your, you know, your toolbox as educators for helping, um, there was a question in the chat, redirect students maybe after a break when they're distracted? Um, my child every day likes to tell me he thinks it's boring. Uh, are there certain uh, tools or recommendations or even like a catchphrase or something that you use that really can help um, with management and behavior? I think that... Um when it comes to management and behavior with the little ones in the house, you have to have structure. And if, um, like the one um, teacher has said that she made the schedule out, I told my, I teach kindergarten. And a lot of my parents are, you know, at their ends with trying to, you know, gather their little person, sit them down to do the work. And as I said, if you could just get them to um, make a schedule, if the parent, if you can get the parents to make a schedule in like 15 minute increments, I don't expect my kids to be able to sit for 30 minutes um, while they're at home in front of a computer. But if you can get them to sit uh, 15 minutes and do like one of the assignments that I have on Google Classroom and just take a pace, take your time, you'll be, be okay with it. But by me having younger people, it's a little bit different than having high schoolers or middle schoolers, you know? I think that's totally right though. I mean, even just having just those little break up little sections helps kids kind of see where they're going, what's next, when we'll be done and how we're going to get through whatever we're doing that day. Uh, I think having a, a child or your, your children sit down and just kind of going and then they don't know how long we're going to do this. You know, what are we doing later? And having just kind of like, all right, we're going to do this for about half an hour, 15 minutes. And we'll take a break. When we come back, we're going to do this. We'll have lunch. Uh, we're going to go for a walk around the yard because that's all we can do. Uh, we'll do one more activity and then we'll call it a day because we'll have covered these three things we wanted to get done and then we'll be done. I think that helps. I mean, when I teach even my freshman in high school, I'm very clear about like this lesson is actually like 45 minutes, not 15. 
if you work with me, if we get our assignments done, if we have good collaboration and we have a good discussion, we'll be done in 45 minutes. And you can have those last five to be freshmen in high school. But if you want to make this into a thing, then we'll take all 50 minutes. So I think just kind of that leveling uh, sometimes helps. Yeah, piggybacking off of that, uh, one of the greatest classroom management tools that I use is having structured, organized lesson plans, like knowing what I want to do by when, how I want to say it, what it's going to look like, how it's going to sound from me, from the kids. Um, so I think as a parent, you know, maybe sitting down and making a calendar, like a monthly calendar uh, filled with like daily or, or weekly checklists, right? Just some boxes to check off, some to-do items for each day or again for each week. And just having an end in mind, you know, like as educators, we usually start at the end and we work our way with figuring out how our lessons are going to look based off of what we want to accomplish. So as a parent, you know, maybe we could make some sort of monthly calendar and uh, figure out what is the most important objective for us by the end of this week and how can we minimize that and uh, simplify it through maybe daily daily goals and just being very structured and having open communication with your with your child about you know how to accomplish each item and you know spin it you know not everything has to be with a uh, pencil and paper Maybe they could uh, record themselves doing a TikTok video of how to solve an equation or what happens when you combine these two chemicals, uh, you know, <laughs> maybe some, some steam or whatever. I don't know. I'm not a science teacher, but make it fun, you know, change up the avenue for how they are supposed to show uh, mastery of their learning. Yeah. The word that, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. The word structure that you use, I think, is very important as a retired educator. Um, I always said the absence of structure breeds breakdown. And one of the things that students need, they need habits. How do you get started every day? How do you go to bed every night? You know, what are your rituals? What are your routines? Maybe starting new, uh, each new activity with a poem or a song, something that's, that's fun. And then another thing I think all parents have, consequences and rewards. What are your consequences for um, not doing what you're supposed to do? What are your rewards for doing what you're supposed to do? But I think the whole idea of structure, they can read on their iPads. They can read their lessons and let them see themselves on their iPads if they have that. But um, I think they're just the whole idea of rituals and routines um, using poems and songs. Thanks, Lorraine. Um, I think with students, I teach a lot of um, students who are struggling readers. And what really helps me with uh, really all students, but particularly when a student has a difficult time focusing, which is what I'm hearing from a lot of my kids, it's hard for me to focus at home, um, is not just like the what am I going to do, but the why am I doing it? Um, that's the key. Uh, so I know if a kid, I can say, hey, read this uh, short story, um, but if they don't know why they're going to be reading it, what they're going to get out of it, then um, just like anything, if I have to sit through a meeting and I don't know why I'm in the meeting, um, I don't want to be there. So that's key. Awesome. It's okay to recognize that a lot of our students right now might not be ready to learn. Like if reading's at nine o'clock, and they're feeling really anxious that day because they've been ripped from the community that they know, like it's probably okay to do some sort of activity that gets them active or moving or do some journaling. Um, so there are ways to address how they're feeling because a lot of our students, our parents, um, educators are experiencing a lot of trauma right now. So it's okay to say, hey, I'm going to switch this lesson today and um, take care of my kids and my own emotional needs right now. Because at the end of the day, that is always more important than whatever academic assignment is um, on, the, on the screen or on the paper. So it's my recommendation. I was gonna say, um, it might not be that uh, easy for parents right now to control the modality that um, 
you know, information is being presented or um, what's being required of uh, their, their kids. But what, you, they, what we know as educators is that uh, students need a little bit of variety in their life. So at least if for those of you who are making the schedule for your kids, I would um, recommend having um, variety in the break. I know I was asking Brian yeah, the other day for more recommendations. Okay, so now what do I do with this 15 minute break? We did painting. We did a Zoom meeting, you know, what's next? But it's exciting, you know, he's going through, my son's going through his regular activities and crossing them out, and he likes when he sees, some, uh, oh, a new break of the day. It just creates a little bit more of um, a hook, you know, engagement if he knows there's something new in his day. You, each of you have, have spoken about things like breaking up the day and I think um, really tending to students' social, emotional needs. What about fun? Is there something that you can recommend that is working or that you would suggest for your students that is a fun activity they can do at home with very few materials or something that, that comes to mind in your classroom that could be done at home that's fun? My name is Ying. I'm actually uh, uh, based in New York, but uh, formerly Seattle. Um, and I've done homeschooling as well as teaching in the classroom and teaching in charter schools. Um, not, not full time, not like many of you, but I'm now a full time parent um, with an eighth grader, a uh, fifth grader, and a kindergarten. And they have different needs. For fun, we actually do um, family time. My husband's home working. Um, I'm kind of also uh, socially, some of the parents in the different classes have advised, you know, the schedule's important. So we came in on Zoom and locking it down so there's no um, Zoom bombing. Um, just, you know, they have their eleven o'clock lunch. So we maintain that. At 11 o'clock, whoever is available will all come in on Zoom and they can have their half an hour. Um, Mind you, they are kindergartners, and <laughs> sometimes with the technology lag, they get headaches from five minutes, from 10 minutes, you know, 30 minutes is a lot. But that gets them having a fun social time without any uh, structure. They can just talk to each other. And at five and at six years old, they're learning it's a one mic situation. It, it didn't take long for them to learn, hey, if someone's speaking, we wait our turn. So, um, that's something fun. And we actually uh, are trying to do this um, video uh, games where everyone, if people have the same games, they can play it, you know, on video. Or you would just have one video board or a board on a video and everybody would tell you where they want to move. So it's not ideal, better to be in person, but, you know, probably easier for the older kids um, than younger. But we also do go noodle, as I mentioned, um, on the chat room. You guys can click on that. And um, I, I am taking notes. So I can send it to where the organizer is. Um, a lot of wonderful um, information nationwide that we don't have access to in New York, but also... Yeah, would... Ying, I'm, I'm the organizer, and you can send it to me at, at community at org. But thank okay. you for jumping in. I appreciate yeah, it. No problem. That'd be great. So, Shayla, I, I do want to throw it to you since you are a drama teacher. And I do feel like as a parent, maybe some of what we're getting is very like math and reading and very, my, my children are younger. I, I'm just with the arts, something we can do at home, something that's fun. Yeah, so this is uh, definitely something that's been really interesting um, with my own kids. Uh, so a couple of things that I could recommend is um, uh, things that do not include a screen, right? Um, to take away that screen time. I know my every Sunday my iPhone is shouting at me that my uh, weekly screen time use has increased. Um, so the arts is a really great way to jump in. A lot of my students who are secondary students, um, they really enjoy improv comedy. So I uh, will um, give each other prompts and then I have students who will I film like a short scene with their family um, or we have like impression time where we'll send each other prompts and you choose an impression and do it. Um, there are a lot of really cool artists and illustrators right now who are posting tutorials. Um, uh, also something that is um, really uh, interesting when it comes to maybe drama or theater is to 
uh, create something. Uh, so that could be uh, um, something that is, can you all hear me right now? Okay, good, sorry, my screen froze. Um, something that is acting based, but also I have so many students who uh, are passionate about music. So um, we might have a, a theme, so, or like I do like a lot of emotion. So here is this emotion, I'm feeling this way, compose a soundtrack um, uh, for me and we make YouTube playlists. I uh, also, when it comes to um, movement, right? My students are totally into the TikTok dances right now. Um, that's a thing uh, that I know a lot of secondary students are interested in. Um, but also, uh, as far as younger students go, um, theater and fine arts can be a really great way to explore the different emotions someone might be feeling in this moment. Uh, so I do an activity that would work with probably any age student um, where I took an event that happened and students uh, created a tableau. So that means kind of like a, a picture of um, what would represent their feelings on the event. So one of the event was being quarantined and my students created um, pictures that showed what they we're feeling when being quarantined. So hopefully that gives a very wide variety of, of thoughts, but there are a lot of really great resources right now of practitioners in the fine arts who are giving um, their time to give really expert lessons. So that's something good too. So if I can piggyback off of what Shayla said in regards to creating something, um, this is something that I say in my classroom and definitely something that I'm saying to my daughters, figure it out. So we have a figure it out time <laughs> where I am just giving you, whether they're old toys, um, worn out clothes, like just a plethora of random objects around the house and they have to create something from that. Um, that is something where there are no rules. I'm not telling you how or what you have to create, but I am giving you these random items and you are going to create something from these random items and i think that as shayla said like the creative portion of it is something that can really be focused on during this time um, because it's it's accessing a different different side of the brain that the academics may not be puncturing right now so figure it out time how does that work i don't know figure it out <laughs> Yeah, I want to piggyback off of that, too, because uh, creation is at the top of Bloom's taxonomy, right? That is the highest form, highest level of thinking. Um, so something I'm going to do, not as, you know, not as wide and, <laughs> and as amazing um, without technology, um, but there's this website, desmos.com. And what I'm gonna do is send out some optional assignments for kids to create a smiley face with a wink or a person or, you know, maybe some sort of landscape using the quadratic equations, linear equations, cubic and quartic and quintic uh, equations that we've done already in the school year and see if, you know, what type of artwork, digital math artwork uh, they could create. Um, but that is very limited to who would be able to do that um, for obvious reasons. But that's just one example, right? Like switch up the avenue. I heard TikTok videos, I heard improv, um, make, maybe make a poster or, some, or something and, you know, make a angry bird background and game using a concave down parabola you know um that would be really cool and put the the little pigs off to the side make some obstacles like that's creative right if we show how to implement math as a tool to our everyday uh discussions and environments um yeah switch it up somehow figure it out <laughs> We're, we're trying. <laughs> um, Brian, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick on you because science has really been a struggle for me. And I tried an experiment with my kids that totally failed. Um, nice. I'm just curious if there's anything, you know, you, that you can think of from your 
um, your classroom that somebody can do at home with very simple activities and, and maybe even adjust for the age of a child? Sorry, I'm definitely putting you on the spot with that question. No, it's fine. Uh, by the way, your experiment didn't fail. You just found another way to do it. So well, my husband threw it away. He didn't realize it was an experiment. So uh, well, I tried. Um, there, there's a variety of uh, resources online. Um, again, the ones I mentioned earlier that will have like really simple experiments you can do with stuff around the house. Um, uh, those, those are fun. Those are all age groups as well. I mean, even in my freshman bio class, we do acetic acid and sodium bicarbonate, which sounds scary, but that's vinegar and baking soda. Um, and so there's just little things you can do with that. Um, for younger kids, that's not my specialty. I'd have to defer to someone else on that, but there's certainly a variety of stuff online of simple at-home experiments you can do. Uh, question. A question. Oh, I'm I was sorry. I was going to say that plant a seed. They had uh, they have some activities around planting. I think that is um, a really nice way to get the younger kids involved, right? But um, also cooking. Uh, just off the top of my head, I was thinking about that, Brian. I know our um, our Mandarin teacher at the school, she has been um, giving simple cooking recipes and asking students to put their own twist with their family and having them post the pictures. So uh, that has gotten a really nice response and it's a great way to be creative with your family. Yeah, I like that. Then you get to eat it at the end. That's excellent. Right. It, it also deals with the lunch period of the schedule or yeah. dinner for those of us who have to do both. Um, so just a reminder for anybody who came on late, uh, we are taking questions in the chat from, from our audience and please put things in the chat and, and we'll try to get to them. Uh, one question I did see up in the chat a little bit earlier today was a question, it sounds like from a teacher to our panel of teachers about what are you saying to parents who feel overwhelmed and how are you structuring any sort of check-in? Are you checking in weekly? What do you feel like is the right balance? And I will say as a caveat, we know that all of us are still trying to find balance. So no judgment on that. Any of you who want to take that on our panel? So I'll start. Um, one thing that I, um, if you didn't hear, I was talking about a parent who was feeling overwhelmed and I had to pause on all the assignments because I do do some posting on Google Classroom for those who do have access. Um, and so once she shared with me that she was feeling overwhelmed, I shared with her, like, it is not that serious. Um, I definitely want you to be emotionally well um, so that you can be emotionally well for your child. And so once we had that conversation and the parent understood, like, I am here to support you, um, has really helped. And so me just expressing to my parents before we even begin this academics that I am here to support you and we are going to get through this emphasis on we because I am as a parent in the same boat as you um, has been very relieving for parents to hear and to know that we are working alongside one another. Uh, uh -huh. Yeah, to go, to go off that, just kind of echoing what we said earlier. I mean, we're all, we're all in, a, in an uncertain place. And so, I mean, do what you can, what you have. And so if that means doing some of the stuff we've talked about, that means with coming up with something else, finding out works for your kid to keep them engaged and not just uh, letting their minds turn to jelly for these weeks. Because um, it's tough on us too. And we've had experience and years in the classroom. So do what you can. From an educator uh, perspective, uh, to an educator, um, I have a daily check-in that I have with my students. It's just a really simple Google form. There's two questions. Uh, do you have any questions for me? And is there anything you want me to know? And that, is there anything you want me to know response? I get lots of things on the topic of jellyfish. I had a student tell me that jellyfish don't have brains. So that was great. But I also get a lot of things about what's happening at home, how they're feeling. Um, I always respond and I always loop uh, the parent in on the response um, so that they know uh, what's happening with their child, how they're feeling about class. 
um, and also that we're in conversation together because um, my parents, they're always my partners, but at this moment in time, um, parents are educational partners. They're the practitioner in the home right now. Um, and my job is not only to support their child, but to support them. So we all need to be communicating so that we are on the same page and also so that they don't feel alone at home. So, yeah. Yeah, I think the common theme here was uh, open communication between all, all partnerships here, student to teacher, teacher to student, teacher to parent, so on and so forth. Um, so yeah, having some sort of, you know, weekly check-in with, with the parents and the teachers would be really crucial just, you know, to level the stress, to reduce the stress and anxiety, clarify expectations, um, figure out what types of supports the family needs because, um, you know, the educational plan is going to vary from household to household and school to school. and um, I think we just have to be, all, everybody has to be very open-minded with, um, with expectations. Mm -hmm. So, and I think that has to be clearly communicated. And if it has to be done weekly because of anxiety, uh, I think that's, you know, um, something small we could, we could do, we could contribute as educators. Um, one thing I will say for teachers, um, as I believe that question did come from a teacher, uh, Teach Plus, which is an organization that I work closely with, we're going to be starting some PLCs for strictly for teachers centered around, um, there's going to be a variety of topics. So I would highly encourage teachers who are on the call, who are interested um, to be looking out or even contact me uh, in regards to joining the professional learning communities for teachers as we are all in uncharted waters. Be a great support. Um, another question coming up in our chat, how are teachers connecting with their students outside of online platforms? Are you able to? And this answer may differ for the CPS teachers versus teachers outside the district. Shayla, you're outside the district about what rules, what you can and can't do. Um, all of my parents have my phone number because I teach kindergarten and a lot of my parents um, that don't have any internet access, I've been able to send them fun activities through the phone and um, um, like that. But as far as connecting, I'd use a lot of Class Dojo. I have 100% um, parents connection to Class Dojo. So I use that a lot also. Um, but the parents that don't have um, the internet capabilities of doing class Google Classroom, that's the biggest challenge right now. And I work, um, the children in my community, um, a lot of them don't have devices. And, you know, a lot of their parents right now are going through the layoffs of the, um, you know, being laid off right now. So the last couple of days, I've just had parents that's just, you know, got laid off. I was like, don't even worry about work right now. Just figure out your basic needs, food, shelter, and, you know, things of that sort. So um, I'm kind of a little bit lucky that I do have kindergarten, you know, and um, so it's a little bit different. It's not a benchmark year for them. Um, we have a little bit more of a flexibility um, and they were already high level as it. So, I mean, they were high in level that I, I don't think that it would be that dramatic if they missed a lesson or two. So, so for other for ways, my, yeah. Go, go. For my school, outside of um, the online platforms, we're all connecting through, uh, through the parents. We're calling the parents regularly. And I'm really thankful for that. Um, I, the parents' response has been great. And uh, we've also extended the opportunity for parents who need um, Chromebook to, um, to loan from our school. So that has been um, working really well. And I think that uh, the, the parents just really in general, they enjoy us, our, our weekly calls. They enjoy listening to the teachers and just you know, having us also check in. We're, you know, we're all in this together. I think it's uh, really important to leverage existing connections. Um, and I agree, 
most people have a cell phone um, these days. So text-based um, messaging apps like the Remind app, which I know a lot of people use, um, I use that pretty heavily. I have my students sign up and my parents sign up as well. Um, I text out every morning the agenda for the day and then something fun. Uh, so I might say one day I had them take a picture if they had a pet, um, take a picture and send it to me or send me your favorite song and I'll make a study playlist and send it out at one o'clock. Um, I make it really clear that I don't expect them to reply every day uh, based on what's happening in their home and in their world, but I will reach out to them every day and I'll always be there. Um, and students are more apt to re, um, respond via their cell phone than like an email. Uh, so that's been really good for engagement as well. And I know my kids who might not have, who might be under connected with Wi-Fi can um, still get those messages. That's great. Okay, we have time for probably two more questions. Um, you know, one, one question I do want to make sure I ask is, because this has come up in, in conversations I've had with parents is, as teachers, what do you predict will happen instructionally when students return? So should, should um, parents of students who say are in the second semester of an advanced math concept expect that when schools return into session, their student is ready to hit the ground running? What, what should parents know about your expectations? I think it's tough to say at this point because that um, I think that's a, a larger conversation to be had with your department and with your you know content area course teams and then ultimately with the administration at your school um, so I don't I don't know I don't know if I have a solid answer for that because it's very uncertain and unknown through my eyes um, but again, I know that there can't be too much harm from keeping things simple and trying to retain what we've done already. Um, at a minimum, I think that is the most important. And then everything else is going to be a larger conversation with, you know, the school structure, the system. How is the system, how is CPS as a whole? going to uh, require teachers to progress with the school year? Are we gonna have to repeat Algebra 2? Are we gonna have to include more concepts next year? Are we gonna have to uh, redefine the geometry course? What, what are we going to have to do? I'm not sure at this point, but I think let's not stress and let's <laughs> try to keep things um, as simple as possible and only control things that we have control over. Uh, Cause that, that's something that, you know, I don't know if any of us have too much control over it just yet. We're living day to day right now. <laughs> well said, well said. I think the uh, most important thing, um, I, I want to echo what he said. I mean, we don't really know. Um, but I would have liked, like to say that I speak for most educators when we say that this, this pandemic, everything that's going on cannot be punitive toward our students. They cannot be at a loss, at a lower place, feel left behind, feel left out because this all went on. Uh, and even in the best case scenario with a child with, you know, their own laptop and internet access and all this stuff, it's still a traumatic thing that everyone is going through. So I know, you know, if I don't get to teach any more biology, uh, new concepts the rest of this year, then that's the way it is and we'll see what happens in the fall. Um, but it's not, it can't be something that hurts my kids. Okay, anybody else want to want to jump in on that one? Then we'll we'll take a closing question if not. Okay, so I just want to go around the 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 group really quickly um, for our teacher panel of final words you would leave this conversation knowing that I can't speak for every parent, but the ones I have spoken to, I think people feel very overwhelmed in this situation and also like a lot is coming at them and they have this responsibility they weren't prepared for. What is your final recommendation or your, your final thoughts that you would share with parents? And maybe Shayla, you're just the closest box to me. So <laughs> yeah. um, I think my, uh, what I 
would want to tell a parent, and I have, is that what you're doing is enough. Whether you have a poster with a schedule and you're following it together, or you're letting your student um, choose their activities, I, you are their parent, you know them best, you are always going to do what's best for them. And whatever that choice is you make, no matter what you see other parents doing, um, that what you're doing is enough. And to allow yourself that grace to know that. And that you have uh, teachers cheering you on um, from behind screens as well. So yeah, that's what I, that's what I would say. Brian, maybe we'll throw to you next because you're the next one on my screen. <laughs> um, I mean, same thoughts. Again, it's been said by a number of educators today. We're all in this together. We're all struggling. We're all trying to make this work. Uh, however, you can make that work best for you and keep your kid or children engaged and excited about learning, I think is important. Um, it's all uncertain for everybody. So whatever you can do. And uh, I mean, I don't know, keep your chin up. We will get through this eventually. So keep pushing forward. Emmanuel, final thoughts? Uh, do what you can and don't stress. Yeah, Carla? Sources, but. Um, parents, you, you, are, you are the experts now. Um, so own it and figure it out. Artemis? I would say stay connected with your teachers. Everyone that I have spoken to misses their kids. They miss their students immensely. And everyone truly has the best intentions. So you are not disturbing anyone by emailing them, uh, dojo, remind. Please reach out and stay connected with your teachers. You're not alone. We got your back. All right, well, uh, thank you to our panel. I'm gonna turn it back over to Caroline for our final words here. Yeah, definitely. Well, um, so appreciative of Carla, Shayla, Brian, Artemis, and Emmanuel, and Cassie. Thank you guys so much. Um, this, was, this has been so fun for me personally and just seeing the wealth of information uh, shared by you guys and also in, in the chat. Um, so no, a couple follow-up um, notes from me. Know that we'll be sending an email out to everyone uh, those who were able to, to join today and those who RSVP'd but didn't, didn't physically join with a recap, a list of, of some of the resources that were shared, um, we'll, we'll be excited to do that. We'll also include a short survey um, that we'd love everyone to take. This is a new frontier for, for Chalkbeat as well. It's our very first virtual event. So give yourself a pat on the back uh, for it going smoothly. Thank you, technology gods. Uh, but we'd love some feedback for you guys because we hope to do more of these in the future and, and really want your input. Um, a special thanks to Golden Apple Educators for Excellence Teach Plus for helping us coordinate this event. Um, we really appreciate you all. And, and again, uh, Caroline, my, you can find us at community at chalkfeet.org. We'll drop that in this chat really quick before, before we leave. Please email us uh, with any questions or thoughts and you can expect an email from us as well. Um, and a final thank you again to Britannica Digital Learning who helped us sponsor this event. Uh, there'll be information on them in that follow-up email uh, as well. So thank you all so much. Uh, feel free to, to drop off this call and continue on with your day, but we're so thankful for this group of educators and this time to share. So thank you.